Good morning, everyone. And um, we praise God for microphones, for ye of little voice. <laughs> My husband has a very loud voice, but mine's not so loud. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, the Bible says, Keep the heart with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is your heart. Because when your heart stops pumping, guess what? You're dead. <laughs> but many people are sick today because the heart is pumping, but it's not pumping very well. Many are sick today because the blood that the heart pumps, and of course that is the issue of life, in Leviticus 17 verse 11, the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And it is the heart that pumps that blood, that issue of life, to every single part of the body. In Australia, we have a lot of sheep, and we've got a lot of land in Australia. And we have sheep stations where there's 10,000 acres. One, one farmer can own 10,000 acres. And a lot of it is sheep. Now, it's a hot climate in the middle of Australia. People say, is it hot in Australia? I say, it depends where you go. If you go to Darwin, the, the climate's the same as Singapore. <laughs> if you go down to the bottom of Australia, they even have a bit of snow down there. But right in the middle of Australia, it is desert, you probably know that. And on the edges, which is where I live, on the east coast of Australia, I live up in the hills. Because you know, just behind the coast in Australia, all along the east coast, there's a gra the Great Dividing Range, which is like a little mountains. Well, I'm up in there. You probably wouldn't call them mountains if you think of Mount Everest, but, but they're sort of hills. So there's a lot of sheep farms. And they do very well, not, not in the Great Dividing Range, but just over you've got quite a bit of land that's not quite desert, but it's starting to get a little drier. And the sheep do well in that environment. You see, if it's too moist, the sheep gets what's called fly-blown. And that is just under their tails, ma maggots can, can develop and... Anyway, I'll let your mind imagine what happens then. And so what the farmer does he cuts the tail off the sheep. Because when you've got thousands of sheep, it's very difficult to check every one every day. And so what they do is they put a little uh, tight band at the base of the tail. And it takes about a week and the tail drops off. Why does the tail drop off? Because what that band has just done is stopped the issue of life, which is the blood. So our body is alive because of the issue of blood going through every single part of our body. So the proverb, keep the heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. We're looking at two things here, which is what I want to look at today, is I want to look at the heart and I also want to look at the blood and the blood vessels that are carrying the heart. So let's begin by looking at the heart. Did you know that the heart is a muscle? And it's like any other muscle in that the more you use it, the stronger it gets. I'll tell you a little story of something that happened to my son Peter. My son Peter, he's 33 I think now, when he was 25, working as a young tiler, he was dismantling a vanity unit that had been built in about the 50s and it was chipped. And as he got that vanity unit off the wall, it slipped out of his hand and hit his ankle. And I think if he hadn't had a bone there, it would have just cut his foot off. And the blood hit the roof. Now, Peter had been training for a triathlon. Peter, every night after work, was running up the hills behind Brisbane and running down the hills, and running up the hills and running down the hills. And his resting heart rate was about 50 beats per minute. So when that blood vessel was cut, the blood hit the roof. Now apparently he called out to my son, my other son, who's about six years older, who was outside, and Peter said, James! And James said, I'm on the phone, mate. Now I tell you this because it took a few minutes before James realised there was a problem in there and went in. James said that when he walked into this little bathroom, all the walls and all the ceilings had this beautiful design of spots of blood. <laughs> the resting heart rate of 50 beats per minute. With a resting heart rate of 50 beats per minute, 
the, the heart is so strong that every beat is so powerful it doesn't have to beat much. Now if Peter had a resting heart rate of about 70 beats per minute, the blood would not have hit the roof. The blood would have just <laughs> maybe hit the wall. Now, praise be to God, the, the wound sealed. He went to hospital, they stitched up the wound and, and Peter healed. In the hospital, the nurses kept taking Peter's pulse. They couldn't believe there was a man with a resting heart rate of 50 beats per minute because people with 50 beats per minute heart rates don't often get into hospital. <laughs> Exercise is often called the forgotten remedy. So one way to prevent your heart failing and one way to restore your heart function is exercise. And as I mentioned earlier in the week, there's a part of exercise that is more powerful than any other type of exercise and it's interval training. So interval training are intervals, let's, let's put it up here, high intensity interval training. It's periods of high intensity and high intensity, most of the experts agree, 30 seconds. Now when you're counting to 30, this isn't 30 seconds, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, okay. You'll feel like counting like that when you're doing high intensity. It's 1 and 2 and got that? <laughs> There's your 30 seconds. And then a recovery time of probably about 90 seconds, that's about a minute and a half. If it takes you three minutes to recover, that's all right, because it won't always take you three minutes to recover. And then this is usually done for a cycle of six. Most of the research looks at, looks at that. So what's high intensity? That can be running up hills, running as fast as you can, can't run, it could be an exercise bike, can't do the exercise bike, rebound. Now if you want to get really high intensity on the rebound, leap as high as you can, can't leap that high. Jog, jog on the rebounder. So you can find different ways to get up that high intensity. Push ups, swimming very, very fast. I'm sure those guys out on the pool this morning were getting their high intensity. Especially when they're doing butterfly. Ever tried to do butterfly? That's the <laughs> one where you leap out of the water. But you see what I mean, anything that will get that heart rate up. Recovery time, not necessarily just sitting, but walking down a hill. You're probably gonna be breathing very deeply and that's when you might, you might do your stretches, might do your lunges. Everyone does their lunges every morning to, to release those legs. You might <coughs> bending down to, to stretch your hamstrings. So that's the best recovery time, is you're not running as fast, and if you're rebounding, your, your recovery time might be just, <laughs> just going a little bit, that's called the health bounce, not even leaving the mat. Now what this does, is it strengthens the heart rate. There's a book called Body, no, this one's called um, Pace, by Dr. Al Sears. He's called the exercise doctor. Pace means progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion. Progressive mean this thing's progressive. You will get better at it. If your recovery time is five minutes now, don't stress about that. It's going to get better because this thing's progressive. The more you do it, the fitter you will get. You see, your recovery time is not indicated by how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. So the fitter you are, the less your recovery time will be. It's progressive acceleration. You are running. You are running for your life. This is no gentle stroll. So when my husband Michael and I do this every morning, we're not chatting while we're doing our high intensity. <laughs> we do the chatting when we're walking down hills. And we actually don't chat in the first few minutes because <sighs> We're breathing like this. So progressive acceleration of cardio, the more you use that heart, the stronger it will get. And it is said that we only have so many heartbeats per lifetime. So if Peter keeps his 50 beats per minute, you know, he could live till 120, is that right? <laughs> so the, the stronger your heart, the less work it has to do, and the more powerful each pump is. 
and it's very nice living in a body that works. Now this high intensity interval training, age has got nothing to do with this. Whether you're 9 or 90, you just got to find out what works for you. It's the best insurance policy that you can make. So cardio, pulmonary. Pulmonary is heart. In my next lecture, sorry, pulmonary is lungs. In my next lecture, I'm going to be talking about the lungs. When you do this high intensity, your lungs start to breathe very, very deeply. So progressive acceleration cardio pulmonary exertion. So the E is exertion. You are moving very, very fast. Now that heart muscle is made up of cells. I'm going to be looking at the cell again in our next lecture. So the glucose goes into the cell and it goes through a 20 step pathway and this 20 step pathway delivers to us a whopping, no, not a whopping, a small, two units of energy. Now the end result of the 20 step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the powerhouse. Even though the powerhouse is only an eight step pathway, it's the one that's going to deliver the whopping 36 units of energy. Now what makes the difference here is oxygen. This is an oxygenated pathway. This pathway has no oxygen. Over on the side, there are little, it looks like a little bunch of grapes, but they're little molecules of glucose. And these little molecules of glucose are called glycogen. And that's where, I don't know any, if any of us exercised this morning because it was raining. <laughs> but if you did exercise, this is where you got your energy. That's why the best time to exercise is before breakfast. Because when you have breakfast, all your energies are going to digestion. You don't want to exercise then. A gentle walk can be good. The best time is before breakfast because before breakfast, Digestion's not happening, so you can put all your body can put all its energies into working your muscles. And these little molecules of glucose are plucked. They're called glycogen. They're called glycogen, and that means quick release glucose stores. Already sitting in your muscle cell, just waiting to be used. Now, when people are eating First of all, the glucose goes through here, and we'll look at this in some other lectures. So if this is a bit complicated, the more I do it, the easier it will get. So when we eat, so the breakfast we had this morning, first of all, the liver particularly sends it down the pathway. But we ate more food than can be put into that pathway, and so the liver causes some of it to be stored as glycogen. Now, I'm sure none of us, but there are some people today that would have had maybe too much for breakfast. And so now, because only so much glycogen can be stored, now the liver stores it as fat. So what happens when we exercise? What happens when we do our high intensity interval training? The 20 step pathway speeds up. And the eight step pathway speeds up. But this pathway is a very fast pathway. And this eight step pathway is a very slow pathway. And right now, as you're sitting in front of me, those pathways feed quite well into each other. But when you start exercising, when you start running for your life, this is, is going to be running a lot faster and this one slower. And because both speed up, more pyruvate's being made than can be fed into here. And so now the body causes it to be stored here as lactic acid. You've heard of lactic acid? Now when you're in recovery time, you've done your high intensity, now you're in recovery time, your liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate. And I think the most exciting thing about the high intensity interval training is that in recovery time, you're burning just as much fuel as when you're running for your life. So can you see that your recovery time is essential? It's not an excuse because you can't go anymore. 
<laughs> so if someone says, what have you stopped for? You can say, well, I'm, bur I'm, I'm actually allowing my liver to convert my lactic acid back to pyruvate. The beauty of this is, this prevents lactic acid buildup. You see that? That's why the research is showing this is the most powerful and the most effective exercise that there is. And why it is so attractive today in our fast society is it only need take 12 minutes a day. Now, if your recovery time is three or four minutes, it's going to take a bit longer. And if you're not used to exercise, you might, in, you might only handle three sessions of high intensity. That's all right. Remember, this thing is progressive. It's progressive. And you just watch and see that mentally, emotionally, spiritually and physically, you will actually be able to form better at any task through the day because you've done this in the morning. Now, the beauty is, when we get to the second set of our high intensity exercise, some of the glycogen stores are getting used, obviously. When we get to our fourth set, we've run out of glycogen stores. So the body sta now starts to burn up the fat stores. So I'm going to make a list over here of how we can keep the heart with all diligence. And number one, must always be number one, is exercise. Now the only time you won't be able to exercise very well is if you're dehydration. So hydration is absolutely essential for proper heart function. But hydration is also important for something else and that's keeping the blood. Keeping the blood nice and thin. It's very hard for the, for the blood to be pumped efficiently and effectively through the heart if the blood is thick. So I'm going to make a list here of blood thinners. There's no need to take rat poison, I mean warfarin. And you know that's what warfarin is. It makes the rats bleed to death. And people that are on warfarin, they just have to knock their, their arm and they bleed. And if they're going to have an operation, they have to stop the warfarin one week before the operation, otherwise they probably bleed to death on the operating table. It doesn't make much sense, does it? The most powerful blood thinner is water. Keep drinking. Two plus litres a day. My habit is I wake at five and I eat at seven. I woke at five this morning. I get so excited when I wake at five. It's my favourite time of the day. So in that hour and a half, I easily drank a litre of water. And I love doing that because that's, that's almost half my daily quota before I even have breakfast. <laughs> now, if I don't drink again, I'm going to be dehydrated by the afternoon. And I don't drink a whole lot at once. I wake up, I drink a half a glass. I get out of bed and go to the bathroom, come back, drink another half glass. I pray, I drink another half glass. I read my Bible, I drink another half glass. I get dressed, I drink another. Can you see how that? I was unable to go out this morning. If I'd had an umbrella, I would have. <laughs> Usually, then by then I'm exercising. When I come back from my exercise, another half glass. And then a few minutes later, another half glass. So it's easy to get a leap a litre in doing that. If you wake at six and you eat at seven, you probably won't be able to get a litre in. <laughs> but at least try for half a litre of water before you eat breakfast. That's very important. Now the best way to ensure that that water is getting inside that cell is salt. And I'm referring to the whole salt. If you're not sure what your salt contains, it's important to ring up the company and say, can I have a mineral analysis of your salt? So seawater. Seawater has the highest concentration of sodium. And seawater contains 92 minerals. Now of those 92 minerals, 30% is made up of sodium. 
Now, just that one piece of information alone tells us how we should be having our sodium with all the other minerals. 50% is made up of chloride. Now, these two minerals are so harsh that if you were to inject them straight into the veins of a person, you would kill them. But what happens today, the water's evaporated from seawater, the first crystals formed, you can see, are sodium chloride because they make up the largest amount. That's scooped up, bleached white, and your minium is put with it, and there's your table salt. Do you know, sometimes they've even got the hide to call it sea salt. Be, ca be cautious if it's white and runs freely because that is not whole salt. Now the salt that we use, I'm not sure what you can get in Singapore, Malaysia, but we use the Celtic salt. And Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. Where are the other 10? They're in such pico proportions. Pico is a measurement that's barely measurable. They're in such small proportions that they're, they're, they're inevitably lost. The Himalayan salt, the Himalayan salt is another very good salt and it contains 75 minerals. That's the salt that we need. We need the balanced salt. You see, when a person's taking just the sodium chloride salt called table salt, it causes a mineral imbalance in and out of the cell and that's how it raises blood pressure. But when you're taking the Celtic salt, it brings a balance in and out of the cell. So table salt can actually get the blood pressure up, whereas Celtic salt can bring the blood pressure down. Now for someone who's not used to salt, I have a word of caution. Start slowly. <laughs> There's probably no way you can have as much salt as I have. I have probably about three fair-sized crystals before every glass of water. If you're not used to salt, start with a tiny little bit about the size of a sesame seed. When you take that salt before you have your glass of water, and that's what I did this morning, I had my salt, I have a little travel pack that I travel with because no matter where I am, I have that little bit of salt. So I have the salt, then I have the water, and the three magnesiums in the salt pull the water inside the cell. It's the quickest way to hydrate a body, is that little bit of salt. You know how some, I'm sure no one here does this, but some ladies at church, elderly ladies, they have a little bag of lollies in their bag and they're giving it to the children. Well, I have a little thing of salt in my bag and I give little bits of salt to the children. <laughs> do they love it? Oh, yes. And what do they do as soon as you've given them salt? They run to the water fountain. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Have you heard of the salt lick? Well, we know it in Australia because we've got so much lamb, we've got dairy farms, we've got lots of cows, and the farmers have a salt lick on the paddock. They've been doing this for maybe 20 years. And the cows look for that salt lick and they lick that salt. And they have found that since the farmers are using salt licks, they don't have as many problems when the, when the calves are born, they don't have as many stillborns, because what's in that salt lick? In that salt lick is minerals. Minerals literally glue us together. You can never heal if you don't have sufficient minerals. Minerals are important. So look at that Celtic salt, which will be, a, it'll be more expensive than, than the salt you usually buy. Look at it as your mineral supplement. So it's very important to make sure your blood is nice and thin and to strengthen your heart is to have salt, but whole salt. Dr. Lilangri, he's a French doctor, he's written a whole book on salt. He said, in, in, a, in France, they don't have a problem with salt because they use the whole salt. And he's written a whole book showing the importance of salt. So there's salt and there's salt. 
So we're going back to our blood thinners. Another very good blood thinner is cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper comes from the capsicum family. Chili comes from the chili family. And there's quite a difference between the capsicum family and the chili family. The chili can be irritating to the gut, whereas the cayenne from the capsicum family is healing to the gut. Cayenne pepper thins the blood. Cayenne pepper thins all the little capillaries. Cayenne pepper strengthens the heart. Now you can get a, it's an e-book, it's called Curing with Cayenne. And Curing with Cayenne is by a medical journalist and his name is Sam Beiser. And he interviews Dr. Schultz and Dr. Christopher, both. American doctors from a probably the 80s, 90s, they were quite famous, who treat only naturally. And he shows in this book that you put cane pepper with any other herb and you actually intensify its action. Such a powerful herb. We, we had a lady uh, at our health retreat, this is a few years ago, when we were in Melbourne, she had a heart attack. And the staff rang me up and said, Barbara, we've just had a lady have a heart attack in the cooking class. So I ran. I was down in the, in the health centre in three minutes. Isn't it important that you're fit? You never know when you're going to be called on. God wants minute men and women, is that right? So I ran down and she was lying on the floor. She was about 80. Her husband said she'd had a couple of heart attacks that year. She had lost all colour in her face. She was half conscious. A guy was holding a pulse. He said, the pulse is almost gone. I said, quick, cayenne pepper. Got the cayenne pepper. I don't know how much I got. I did it in a hurry, maybe half a teaspoon. Put it in her mouth. Gave her a little bit of water. And in two minutes, the, the guy holding the pulse said, the pulse is strong. Two minutes. Did you know it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go through your whole body? What an amazing body we live in. So how quickly did that bring her out of it? What did it do? As soon as the cane pepper got into her blood, because there are blood vessels and there are glands in your mouth that can take it up quite quickly. Oh. Ye of little voice has to become ye of strong voice. I was told that if I go deep, I can go louder. <laughs> Thanks, is that, that <coughs> that's better? Yes? How often will you take the cane pepper? I will tell you. Now, what it says in this book, and by the way, what happened when I gave the lady that cane pepper? It immediately thinned the blood it immediately opened all the blood vessels to get a more powerful delivery of blood through her whole body. That I suggest when someone wants to go with a quarter of a teaspoon of cane pepper in a little bit of water three times a day. It's the easiest way to do it. Stir it in, throw it down. Yes, it'll tingle, but the tingling stops fairly quickly. Only in a few minutes. Some people wouldn't call it tingling, but it, it can never hurt you. In fact, it'll heal a stomach ulcer. That's how remarkable cayenne pepper is. We've got a little book in our health retreat. It's called Curing. No, haven't got that one. Yes, we have got Curing with Cayenne, but the other one I want to talk about is Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. You might be familiar with it. It's a very well-known um, herbal book written in about, <coughs> I don't know, I think it was written in the... Uh, early 1900s. He devotes 10 pages, sorry, he devotes, yes, 10 pages to cane pepper, but he devotes half a page to every other herb. And in that book, Curing with Cayenne, no, we're back to Back to Eden. Back to Eden's a remarkable book, but the beauty of, I'm getting all mixed up here, I'll start again. So, Sam Beiser wrote the book Curing with Cayenne and it looks at cayenne in every way. And the reason I'm 
mentioning Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss, he looks at every herb and he devotes half a page to every herb, but not cayenne pepper. Ten pages to cayenne pepper is such a remarkable herb. You see, it moves blood. And what does the Bible say? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And anything that moves blood is going to increase the healing. So when a person's coming off blood thinners, very important that they drink adequate water. Very important they start with that little bit of salt. Important that they have a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper three times a day. Can they put it on their food? Of course they can put it on their food. But some people don't like the heat, they just want to get it over and done with and then just enjoy their meal. And some people enjoy their meal better if there's cane pepper all over it, so I'll leave it up to you. But it's a remarkable blood thinner. Let me tell you too, that if a person is implementing these things, they can stop, ca they can stop warfarin and they can stop aspirin immediately. Now, if a person's on cortisone, the person's on antidepressants, they can't do that. So some drugs need to be eased off, but, but not with this one. It can be stopped immediately. Also, ginger. Ginger's a blood thinner. One of my, well, my favorite tea is ginger tea. You can grate up the ginger, pour boiling water on it. When I was in Bermuda six weeks ago, the house I stayed in had a packet of ginger tea. So I was having ginger tea and it's made in Jamaica and it just, mix, it just dissolves into the water. And when they saw I liked it, they sent me home with four boxes of ginger tea. Very nice. Ginger tea warms the body. Ginger tea increases digestion and ginger thins the blood. Garlic is another powerful blood thinner. number one killer is heart disease. And what are we told is the cause of heart disease? Cholesterol and saturated fat. Do you know there's no proof? Isn't that shocking? There is no proof that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease. If saturated fat cause heart disease, why weren't the South Pacific Islanders who eat coconut every single meal why weren't they dying of heart attacks and strokes when white man landed? They've never even heard of heart attacks and strokes. And I mentioned last night the ketogenic diet, which is a high fat diet that's been used since really the 20s to control epilepsy. Those people don't die of a heart attack and they don't have strokes. Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, he's written a book, The Great Cholesterol Con. He's a cardiovascular surgeon and he's scathing on this theory. He said, there is no proof. Show me the proof. Now that's shocking, isn't it? You remember last night I told you about Revelation chapter 12? And it talks about the great dragon being cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. And this is one area where he's deceived the whole world very effectively, am I right? He's a de what's a deception? It appears like it's good, but it's a total deception. I call it the greatest criminal medical hoax that's ever been put on human beings, and there's been quite a few, is this myth that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease. Because this is a myth. It's not true. So what causes heart disease? And what is cholesterol? Let's have a look. The liver makes cholesterol. And the liver makes cholesterol according to the body's demands. If the body needs a lot of cholesterol, the liver will make a lot. If the body doesn't need much cholesterol, then the liver won't make much. And cholesterol 
Let's have a look at what it's made out of. So 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose. And 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from fat. Now looking at this piece of information, students, can you see that it's not the butter on the bread, it's the bread under the butter that's the problem? Mm-hmm. Do you know who first blew the whistle on this, big time, was Dr. Robert Atkins in the 1980s. He had a diet. You remember his diet? It was low carb, high fiber, generous meats and fats. And all his patients with high cholesterol levels were going back to normal. And what are they eating? Cheese, butter, cream, eggs, meat, fish. <laughs> Scratched his head because he only did it for weight loss. And what he found in the research is that high carbohydrates, what's that? Wheat bix and toast for breakfast, sandwiches for lunch, pasta for tea, cakes, biscuits, donuts, mid-morning, mid-afternoon. High carbohydrate. High carbohydrate stimulates the pancreas to make more insulin and that more insulin stimulates the liver to make more cholesterol. The wrong guy's been shot. The fat's not the problem. On this high carbohydrate diet, first of all the glucose goes down to the pathways, then the body stores it, but it's got so much excess, what does it store as? It stores as fat and it's one of the most <coughs> dangerous fats in the body. The stored fat from the excess carbohydrate. So let's have a look at the two different types of cholesterol. HDL, high density lipoprotein, Here's the carrier. HDL is called the good guy because it carries excess cholesterol back to the liver to be reused. LDL, it's called the bad guy, but do you know the body doesn't make anything bad? Mm -hmm. What LDL does, it's the repairer and the rebuilder. So wherever you've got damage, what have you got? LDL. LDL does something else. It delivers cholesterol to the brain. Did you know that the fattiest organ in the body is the brain? And what part of the body does the great deceiver, the roaring lion, want to take down? Our brain. Every membrane around every cell is 50% fat, except for the brain cells, they're 70% fat. So the fattiest organ in the body is the brain, and the brain loves fat as fuel. So what's the first organ to go down when it hasn't got enough cholesterol or enough fat going in? The brain. Can you see how he has deceived the whole world? The great deceiver. Let's have a look at how they work in the body. So we're going to draw the blood vessel here. Here's the blood vessel. Now in the blood vessel, LDL, because of its low density, it's always on the edge. And HDL, because of its high density, is always in the middle. Now if a person's smoking cigarettes, 4,000 chemicals in a cigarette those chemicals can damage the cells lining the arterial wall. Let's say the person's living in a mouldy house. Do you know if mould gets into the blood, it's toxic. It can, it can damage the cells lining the artery. And if the person's having a high sugar diet, sugar's a toxic acid. Sugar can also do holes, but it also can feed the microbes that poke the holes in. Let's say the person's eating a lot of fish, the fish is high in mercury, mercury is a neurotoxin. It can damage also the cells. Well, they've got a lot of mercury fillings in their mouth, that can damage the cell. Okay, students, who's going to plug up the hole? LDL. LDL. So it comes along and it plugs up the hole. But the problem is the person doesn't know the danger of the cigarettes. The problem is the person doesn't realise that their, their mouldy house is killing them. You can go to Google 
and you can put in Mouldy. And there's a little 30 minute DVD and it'll, it, it's actually quite shocking. It's about these people, some of them even early 30s, who were getting sick, could hardly walk. No one could work out what was wrong with them. They were living in a Mouldy house. It's just called Mouldy. The person doesn't realise their mercury fillings are killing them. They don't realise, they, they think that fish is healthy. Well, the fish was healthy when Jesus walked the planet. But I challenge you to buy a fish today that's healthy. So the damage is continuing. As I said earlier, many are sick through ignorance. Ellen White says in Ministry of Healing, page 127, and the only hope of better things is the education of the people in the right principles. So what's happening to the people? The artery wall is building up. And then the person happens to get a little dehydrated one day and the blood cells clump and ah, they have a heart attack. Ah, they have a stroke. Blocks the blood vessel. When I worked in the operating theatre, we did a bypass. And once we'd cut out the artery, you wouldn't believe what they do. They saw the chest, they claw it open, they go in, they find the artery, they cut that out, then they cut an artery down in the leg out and just sew that up and then sew that artery back in here. Do you know the artery in the leg is not made of strong material like this is because by the time the blood gets down to the legs the flow isn't as strong. So how long is this going to artery going to last? That's the only answer medicine has. It's a very brutal operation and it really isn't the answer. And the surgeon had the artery that he just cut out the operation had finished and then he got his tweezers and he started to pull the white gristle out of the artery. And what do we call that? Cholesterol? Yeah, plaque, which is made up of cholesterol and calcium deposits. So who's being blamed for the problem? Cholesterol. To blame cholesterol for heart disease is like blaming the fire trucks for the fire. They must cause the fire, they're always there. That's like blaming the ambulance for every accident. Well, they're the only common denominator at every accident, so they must be the problem. So what causes heart disease? Damage to the arterial wall causes heart disease. So the person has a heart attack and the doctor puts them on cholesterol-lowering medication. Hmm? You wouldn't believe how many people in Australia and America are on statin drugs, cholesterol-lowering medication, because cholesterol is being blamed for the problem. Are you ready for the side effects of cholesterol-lowering medication? Dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss, muscle wasting, and they've just added another one, breast cancer, because our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. Is this the answer? So what they've done in Australia today, they've convinced the people it's fat, so people are on fat-free diets, and they've made a spread to put on bread that they say is better than butter because butter will cause heart disease. It's called margarine. It's one of the most dangerous things that can go into the body regarding foods. In fact, the margarine structure has been so changed that the body doesn't recognise it. When margarine comes in, the body goes, alien from out of space has just entered, what are we going to do with it? Quickly throw it out via the skin and that's contributing to skin cancer. Yeah? Flaxseed margarine, if you look at flaxseed oil, is it liquid or solid? solid. It's liquid. So what have they done to it? to make it solid. Can you see, the only, f the only fat that's solid in the fridge is coconut oil and palm oil, and, and say butter. They're saturated fats. So any oil that's in a margarine form, they've changed the structure, they've hydrogenated it, and now it's a structure that the body doesn't recognize. Sometimes they say, olive oil margarine, what have they done to it? Flaxseed margarine. 
are nut alex. Some clue in market to put nut in the word and everyone thinks that's a bit healthier. If it was polyunsaturated margarine, you would open the lid and it will be liquid because poly means many, many bonds causing it to be liquid. Every tub of margarine is a saturated fat as much as butter and coconut oil. But it's far worse, far worse, <coughs> because now it breaks down to molecules your body cannot recognise. In fact, if someone has a live blood and analysis after they've had margarine, they can look into the microscope and see their, their white blood cells exploding. It is so dangerous. Now, if you've just bought a tub, what's my suggestion? Throw it in the bin, but it costs money, well, just close your eyes. <laughs> Just picture your white blood cells exploding when you take it. Do you know if I'm travelling on a plane and I get a, a meal and there's, a, I usually take my own bread, and there's a little tub of butter, I'll put it on my bread. Your body knows butter, but I rarely eat it. If a little tub of margarine's there, I will not touch it. I will not touch it. Otherwise, I just picture my white blood cells exploding. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. Now, I'm not sure what your levels are, so I'm going to give you American levels and I'm going to give you Australian levels of cholesterol. And we are now going to be having a look at another shocking deception that's happened. When I was in America doing a health retreat two years ago, a nutritionist was doing our program and she was 69. Now, please stop talking because you don't want to miss this. So she was 69. Do you know what that means? She trained when she was, she trained at university 40 years ago. She said 40 years ago in America, they considered that anyone under 300 was a good cholesterol level. Hmm? They've changed it. Today, it's 200. Have we changed? No. What's that in Australian standards? It would be about 7.5, so I'm not sure the scale that you use here. So that was normal. So what do they say now? You have to be under five. It's a lie. One girl said to me in America, my doctor says I, I, my cholesterol levels are dangerously high and I've got to go on cholesterol-lowering medications. She's 30. I said, what are your levels? She said, 191. I said, did you know that if you had your, if, if, you, if it was now in the 1980s and they saw 191, they'd say, oh, your, your levels are good. I said, don't even consider it. What does the devil want to take down? Does he want us all to get memory loss, Alzheimer's and dementia? And that's exactly what the cholesterol lowering medication does. The Framingham Heart Study. This is a study that was done, oh, it was started about 30 years ago, little town of Framingham. It's, I love this study because the pharmaceutical companies didn't set it up, the dairy industry, the meat industry, the grain industry, the sugar industry, it's independent. And they set it up to prove that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease, but it's not doing that because people with low cholesterol levels are having heart attacks. People with medium cholesterol levels are having heart attacks. But do you know what it did show? It showed that people with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's. Do you need a moment's silence to digest that? <laughs> so people with 7.5 cholesterol, 8.5 cholesterol, 300 cholesterol, whether what your scale is, they don't get Alzheimer's. Why? Because the brain needs cholesterol. Do you know what the fattiest food on the planet is with the highest cholesterol levels? Breast milk in the first month of life. Are they going to ban that? A baby's having heart attack? Can you see it defies reason? That old serpent which deceived the whole world. If you have been deceived, I'm not surprised. 
because the media is strong in this one. Even Christian radio telev and television stations, well, we don't do radio anymore, do we? Television stations. What are they saying? If you want to prevent heart disease, reduce the salt and stop the fat. Is that right? It's a lie. Oh, the deceiver has been successful. Don't let him be successful in your life. That's why the Bible says, as a roaring lion, he walks about seeing whom he can devour. And what part does he want to take down? It's our brain. If you're on cholesterol-lowering medication and you stop today, there will be a side effect. Your memory will return. <laughs> Your muscles will get stronger. That's the only side effect. We had a chemist do our program. She said, I'm 60, I've been a chemist for nearly 40 years. She said, I have my own private practice, I work in a hospital. She said, I'm annoyed. She said, recently a circular came round to all doctors that anyone with a cholesterol level above 3.5 had to go on cholesterol lowering medication. She said, I'm annoyed because it's just a money-making scheme. If you're told you're to go on cholesterol-lowering medication, how long are you told you're on it for? Life. She said, I'm annoyed. If someone's on antibiotics, they're on it for a week. If they're on cholesterol-lowering medication, they're on it for life. It's just a money-making scheme. There's only one person that's interested in your health, and that is God. And you know what God deals with? Facts, truth. And many people go on cholesterol lowering medication because of this. Yeah? One lady said, I cannot stop my aspirin. I said, Why not? She said, The doctor said I will die. You know what one lady said? When the doctor told her that, he said, You're not God. There's only one person that knows when I'm going to die. Is that right? Hmm? You know, it is up to us to prove, or I was going to say our doc, I actually don't have a doctor. I never have blood tests and I never go to the doctor. I have never had a cholesterol test. I have never had a blood thinning test. I have ne never. <laughs> I, think I, I think someone took my blood pressure about 10 years ago. I'm just not interested. Mm. It was pretty low, but I'm not passing out all day, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, your body will tell you if there's a problem, is that right? Yes, it will. Unfortunately, most people are so used to living in discomfort, they almost think it's normal. I hope I've dispelled any myth that you might have, any, um, any idea of this and that's why when you see the media you can catch them out. So let me give you the name because we need to source these things out and have the truth behind us. So his name's Dr Malcolm Kendrick and this is a powerful source because he's a cardiovascular surgeon, he's performing bypasses all the time and he wrote the book The Great Cholesterol Con. So the great cholesterol con. So it's very important that we eat a plant-based diet and that plant-based diet should be high in fiber. Your vegetables are heart protective. They contain all the essential minerals that we need. Generous amounts of protein. Most people I find, especially vegetarians, are protein deficient. I'm not advocating a high protein diet. I'm advocating a high fibre diet. But we need the protein. The protein can come in the form of legumes, as Genesis 129 says and seeds. Did you know that pumpkin seeds is 
0.8 grams of protein to a cup of pumpkin seeds. That's higher than any meat. I was very glad to see they had a bell of pumpkin seeds there this morning. And nuts and healthy fats. What are your healthy fats? Fats as they come from the hand of the creator. So there's your avocados, your coconuts, your nuts, your seeds, plus your olive and coconut oil. They're the two oils that come from the flesh of the plant. They're the most stable oils. What also is necessary to recover the heart if it's not been functioning properly other than all of this is early nights. We need to be in bed by 9 p.m. <coughs> except, this, except this week. And we need to be sleeping between 9 and 2 a.m. Well, we're going to get to bed a bit earlier tonight because we're going to have our MOS meeting from 7 till 8 and the second meeting from quarter past eight to about nine. But that's only this week. Because of technology, people are going to bed too late. Too late. And because of technology, people aren't sleeping well. I woke to the thunder in the night and thought, oh, how nice, and drifted straight back to sleep. So that's when we need to be sleeping. In another lecture, we're going to look at sleep in a little bit more detail because we should be sleeping. Okay. Yeah? Um, we should be sleeping between 9 and 2. They're the hours of power. It doesn't mean you wake up at 2. <laughs> <laughs> but after 2, thank you. After 2, um, After two, that's just your dozing time. So they're the hours of power. When we look at sleep, I'm going to show you exactly what happens in those hours and it will explain to you why they're so important. Yes? Pardon? Uh, tofu. Tofu is a very good source of protein as long as it hasn't been genetically modified. As long as it has been organically grown. You have to search that out. In America, they've genetically modified the soybean to resist Roundup. It's called Roundup Ready. And a farmer told me that five times before harvest, that means every month the, the whole field is sprayed with Roundup. So that soybean has five doses of Roundup in it. Problem number one, genetically modified. Problem number two, it's full of environmental poisons. That soybean will increase breast cancer. That soybean will increase prostate cancer. That soybean will cause young 15-year-old boys to develop breasts. That, you see, that's the problem. Now, later, I'm not sure exactly when, today or tomorrow, I'm going to be looking at hormones in detail and I will explain that then. And I will show you how there are oestrogens that are damaging and there are oestrogens that are protective. So I'll be defining that in the hormone lecture. Um, sometimes we make to believe that during the deep sleep hours certain organs are being are cleaning. Yeah. Is that true? That is true. That is true. In fact it's in these hours that your cells, and of course we are, we are a bunch of cells, every organ in the body is being uh, rejuvenating, cleaning and rejuvenating. That is true. Yes? How would you distinguish between the uh, modified soybean and the real soybean? How would you distinguish between the modified soybean and the true soybean if it says organic? <laughs> you see, an organic farmer cannot use genetically modified soybean, otherwise he loses his organic status. <coughs> So unfortunately they don't define it, but it, but it should be organic. If it's organic, you can be 99.9% .9 sure. I have to do a 0.9 because there's a great deceiver that's trying to deceive us. You do the best you can. But I think it's a good idea not to depend on soy as your main source of protein. 
I might eat soy once a week or twice a week, but every day I eat legumes. That's your black-eyed beans, your cannelloni beans, your... Such a cheap form of protein. And when you buy a packet of beans, you soak it and you've got double. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Sorry, that's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. So let me go to back to 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 16 and 17, where it says, Know you not that you are the temple of 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 God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. There it is. And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And then when you go over to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. And ye are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I'm sure meaning belong to God. So we actually have no right not to look after this body because we don't even own it. <laughs> and I believe that we will be possibly a little bit shocked when God holds us to account for what we have done to this body. And oh, how God's work has lacked because so many are sick and many are sick through ignorance because there is a great deceiver that has deceived even God's people. Oh. And that's why I love it when I read one day one writer called the Bible, Satan's Detector. When you are reading the word of God, you can see where it is. And what is more powerful than even all the miracles on the planet is a firm reliance on thus saith the Lord. So, I read that this morning and it was in page 120 of Desire of Ages. I thought that was very powerful. More than all the miracles is a firm reliance on a thus saith the Lord. Please bow your heads while we close and have a break. Father, thank you so much for this information on the heart. Thank you so much for your truths, for opening our eyes on the truth, on keeping the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Maybe we, we each be diligent, Father, at keeping our heart, our blood vessels, in a fit state for your work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.